And so the things that I want to cover is basically give you an insight into our performance in our neck of the woods, what drives that performance, um, how I'm responding to the future to lift my profitability, and also talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in our neck of the woods. Um, just to give you a bit of a background of where I come from or where I'm currently farming, um, I'm a, I, uh, my family, we've, we've got a property at Bark Hall, it's about 15,000 hectares. Um, we have very low stocking rates, about one DSC to the hectare. We use a great artesian basin for all our water. Um, we run a mostly merino flock, but we do do a little bit of trade cattle and adjustment from time to time. And um, it's basically my wife and I and our three kids that run the show. Um, and our philosophy is to be profitable. Both of us come out of other backgrounds and we're very focused on making money. Um, and I've learned enough of, in my walks of life to know that you need the money in the good times or always be fairly focused on profitability because it's amazing how quickly a bad time can come around and it's the profits of the good times that'll get you through the bad times. Um, our rainfall is um, extremely variable. Um, our average rainfall is about 490 mil a year, but the median rainfall is 450. And uh, Roger Stone, who's a Bureau of Meteorologist um, up there in um, Brisbane, tells a story that um, Australia has the most variable rainfall in, um, in the world, and uh, Queensland has the most variable rainfall relative to all the other states, and my part of the world has the most variable rainfall in um, uh, in the whole of Queensland. And so between the variations of rainfall when we get rain events and wet years and when we don't is really important to how we plan and I think it's going to be more important the successful guys will handle the variation a lot more going forward. The other thing about that rainfall there is it's not the amount of rain we get, it's the evaporation. It's really, it's a hot environment. So at the moment we're in the news because Longwich has just had about 20 days in a row. Here we are going into autumn where the daily temperature has been over about 41 degrees Celsius. So it's hot. This is just take you on a quick farm tour. Um, this is in April. We grow a big body of grass out of the monsoon the rainfall. 60% of our rain arrives in the, in, the, in the summertime. We grow this big body of grass and uh, our country looks like that. We've got a, a, um, some trees. Um, that's probably pretty more typical of the Mitchell Grass Downs country that we've got. I've got two photos in here that look the same, which I'll be talking to you later on. That's in, uh, that's in uh, June there. And, and he, this is one of our pasture monitoring points, and, that, and that's the driest month of the year, middle of September. And so feed budgeting plays a really important role when you're working at how much, how much haystack you've got left and how long do you think it's going to last for, and looking at the risk of rain going into summer. It's, it's a real skill base in managing that pasture base, because if you graze it down, flog it out, you'll lose a lot of your capacity to run animals, and you, or you'll have a much lower um, stocking rate going forward for, for a number of years. We have good years. That's a sheep there. Um, you can just see the back of a sheep. Um, so that's a good year. Uh, that's a really good year. Um, and the rain fell the right way. Uh, that's an average year. It's, it's beautiful when it's green. Um, and, th and that's this year. So those two photos are actually about this time last year, the last two photos, and, and this year. So we're having a tough year. And, we're gonna have, and, and going forward, we know we won't get much rain until um, October, November this year. So we're in for a, a rough run. Um, our production system, about 12,000 merino sheep self-replacing. I've got a genetic program in place that's really based on all the principles coming out of um, the Sheep CRC and Sheep Genetics Australia um, and uh, based on all their best practice principles. Um, we lamb when we've got the best chance of green grass, which is April, May. We sell towards the end of the growing season when our sheep are fat. Um, and hopefully the autumn break down south has occurred and um, sheep prices spike up due to a lack of supply to the abattoir systems. So we sell all our um, animals, uh, we try to aim at that time of the year, um, tend to get the better prices. Um, and, and a really good rule of thumb is not to have any lactating or, dr or pregnant animals after about the end of June. Doesn't always happen, but um, it's a good rule to operate by because it's pretty, that, that cardboard, forest that we've got out there is, is a death zone for sheep no matter how much grass you've got after about the end of June. The feed quality is so poor. What do we produce? Well, um, we produce a sort of MF5E wool, so it's a fairly standard fair type of wool. We're quite fine, as you can see. Um, and it's wool, that's wool, it's wool. It's just a commodity. We produce um, very similar wools to everyone else in the rest of Australia. Um, we shear in December and our cull for age sheep um, mostly sell scanned in lamb uh, used to restockers down south and our mutton weathers um, we put them on auction plus 
and they go to markets all through southern Australia. We sometimes catch the boat trade out of um, um, Portland, down in Victoria, and, and, and um, sometimes the pie shops at the back of Melbourne, but our animals go a long way to market. This is where we're based. So a couple of things about this little part of the world. Um, that's the cattle world that's there, and that's where the feedlots are. So a tremendous number of animals go past my front door on the way to the feedlots. And several years ago, when the cattle guys were allowed to borrow money, they came into our neck of the woods, with, this is all sheep country just all around Longreach just there, um, and bought up a lot of country. So, you saw, so there's a real situation going on in partial zone, particularly in Queensland, in terms of falling sheep numbers. And that's part of the problem, or part of the cause, I guess. Um, um, and so um, that's where we're located. So now we're talking about profitability. Why am I running sheep in that part of the world where there's just so many cattle and it's so obvious to be a cattleman and jump on board with those guys? And this is one of the main reasons. Um, first of all, I'd say that there's actually really poor benchmark data out there in our part of the world and probably in the parcel zones that talk about the profitability of sheep versus cattle. It's hard to get good data. One source is ABEAR. Um, and so when you look at that slide there, you can see um, the performance of specialist sheep in central western Queensland versus specialist beef in central west Queensland. And, and that only goes to 2012-13. So imagine where that red line goes for the next couple of years when they lost the live export markets and they went through a pronounced drought. Cattle are much more sensitive to dry times. In our environment, you're eating that cardboard castle um, or that cardboard forest. And so animals spend a lot of time only maintaining weight. Cattle systems or beef systems are all about growth. And, and so therefore, if, you, if you've got a system like ours, um, I, I believe we'll swing our system a lot more to uh, maintenance, weight, weight maintenance systems uh, have got an advantage over growth systems, body, body growth systems. So with that sort of data around, and secondly, having a strong background in sheep production, I was always going to be a sheep farmer. But I am a businessman and I'm always asking the question, should I be in wool sheep? Um, here's our performance. Uh, this data is from Holmes and Sackett. Um, and I've compared my, I'm in the blue lines. And um, uh, this profit is, is, a, uh, is a forecast profit, but we've already sold the wool, we've sold the cattle. And so we're gonna have another good year. We've just got to race to the end of the financial year without any fiascos and we'll, we'll bank another really good profit. Um, this is um, ABEAR's industry averages down here, the green line. And um, so um, business has been pretty good for us, but I certainly know I'm going into a ripper drought and it'll have really big implications. So that's a bit of a double guess, that one just there. That's the, the impact on the flock at the moment um, from the drought and the sales of so many sheep will mean I'll have very few sheep going into October this year and the wet season, and it might well mean that, and it's hard to buy replacement sheep, cattle are gonna be expensive, so I'm gonna probably have a low stocking rate year in that one, so I'm predicting low profits. This performance in here is actually interesting, that's the loss of live export and dry times in central New South Wales. Um, and that's also a de decreased lambing percentage, and that's also, that's a really big drought for us just there, and that, that caused that performance. But that loss of live export on top of dry times in central New South Wales had a massive impact on our business. We just weren't able to destock, so we had to take chances and retain animals that were worth nothing. And we got a lot of mortality and other things like that because we, we, we retained animals that should have gone to market. Um, when we look at some of those financials, um, that's us five-year average up against um, Homes and Sackett data. And really quickly, you can see we run at much lower costs than, than mainstream Australian wool producers in the Homes and Sackett database. And our overheads are also low. But it's this one up here that's the bad one for us. We, we're, we are unproductive, or our, our sheep are unproductive. And so when you look at some of the productivity benchmarks, really quickly moving through this, our cost of production is low. I reckon that's quite high for us at the moment. Remember, this is a five-year average, so we've had a couple of corky years where we didn't grow much wool due to floods and, and those low lambing percentages. Um, we tend to get the same price as everyone else. Uh, you'll see my micron story shortly, but this is the big one. Uh, our sheep just don't cut enough wool. And, and is it a genetic thing or an environmental thing? And I think it's a lot of environment. Um, but I've got to link my genetics into southern sheep a lot more to understand whether there is a genetic story there. Um, our landmarking percentages, this is a five-year average, so there's been a couple of corkers in there of 30s and 20 percenters in there, and one or two of 75, so that's low. 
And, and nowadays we're getting about 65% of our income from wool and, and the rest of it is from meat sales. So meat sales, once upon a time it used to be like 95.5 in terms of all of our money came from wool sales and we virtually got nothing for our sheep. Now, with that swing across to the, these good meat prices and mutton prices, we've got to start looking a lot more at our lambing percentages because uh, it's going to be a, a, an area of growth. We run the same number as weather as everyone else. And one of the things that we've got in, 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 as an advantage over everyone else is scale. Here I am up against the Homes and Sackett database. My business is running, is, is, um, that's my enterprise size there, but I'm running a lot more DSCs per labour unit than the, than the fellas down south. So we've got an advantage in that area, and that's driving our, our low cost base. Production issues, the animals are on low quality pastures for a long time in the year. We get highly variable rainfall, high, high mortality rates or higher, low lambing percentages, and there's a number of reasons for that, and relatively, I think, unproductive sheep. Needs further investigations. So what am I doing to make more money going forward? I want to protect that pasture base at all cost. I've got to come up with new ways of dealing with that variable season. I'll talk about each of these shortly. Genetics, uh, you've just got to jump onto that ASBVs. And uh, this year we, we even bled our sheep and did the uh, 50K test for genomics to understand and try and get them ranked up against sheep across Australia to understand that whole question about my genetics. Want to lift our, lifetime, uh, our sheep productivity, so I've enrolled in the Lifetime New Management Program. It's a great program um, run by AWI that helps us understand what drives reproduction in our sheep, and, uh, and I've grabbed a lot of those things. Um, and there's some other things in there uh, in terms of continuing to drive down the use of humans in our system with CapEx programs, labour-saving gear is every, all over my place. And, uh, mob, and, and, and there's real benefits going forward on mob segregation. We've never really mucked around with 20 years, but I think we need to learn how to do that going forward if we're going to drive profitability. Here's, um, and so here's how I'm sort of thinking. Um, and so it's probably this column over here that you need to look at, and you can see some of the things that I'm doing. It's probably the same slide again. Um, here are my benchmarks, here's my targets, and here's what I'm going to do about it. Labour efficiency capex. Supplement programs, we're going to wind up, we're going to feed sheep so they don't die, and we're going to feed them so they have their lambs, and so we're going to spend money in this area here. I'm about the only person in our district that's got a silo full of cereal grain. There's a lot of people that believe you don't feed sheep, so there's quite a wide variation in our understanding of how to make our animals productive. Um, we've got to get onto this breeding index. We're fine enough, but we've now got to really shift uh, what we're, we, I chased the micron thing just like everyone else did and now I've got to turn and start driving up wool, wool cut per DSE and, while keeping micron uh, fine. Uh, some comments about sustainability. Um, I'm lucky uh, it's a family owned business. We've been there for a very long time. We recognise the value of our pastures. And as I said earlier, Genevieve and I, we intend to make money out of our business as much as possible. Um, but we know we've got to look after those environmental assets. And when you think like a person that's been there for a long time thinks, I'm farming an heirloom. I'm not farming a... Um, there's, sometimes I lose that business way of thinking and I'm dealing with a family heirloom. Um, it's a lucky thing. Um, there's our environmental uh, plan or grazing management plan there and here's some of the key strategies we put in place. Wet season grazing rest, to give those, those plants a chance to get their roots down and build up the, uh, uh, the carbohydrate stores in their root systems so that they can handle a drought because next summer it mightn't rain. We graze down to set targets and then we destock. Are we matching our stocking rates to our long-term carrying capacities? And we keep our pastures in, in A condition. That's really critical in terms of the long or the medium-term carrying capacity because the more animals you can run, the lower it'll reduce your cost of production. So I'm quite aggressive on stocking rates as much as I can be in this part of the world, but I'm measuring my pastures closely because I know that if I wind it up, I'll flog my paddocks out and in five years' time I'll, I'll be running 80% less or 20% less animals than what I currently run. Um, this is just to tell you a bit about our story of rainfall and variation. I measure rain in different ways, our summer rainfall, and so calendar measurements of rainfall don't really tell a story in here, these were massively wet years, and it's only when you look at the summer rainfall percentiles, there was only one or two years that we received more rain in every 100 years. 
So you've got to do your analysis on rainfalls because we're all about being driven by rain. So we'll, we got good rain in that time and then we're ripping into a really good drought at the moment and it's been going for a while. I'm sitting on the edge of it, fortunately, but um, it, it's having real impact on, on the others that, are, that have got ones and twos in those, those columns there. And this, is, this is, tells a story about, ver about managing your stocking rates and having a, one of the things that you've, we've got to start thinking a lot more in our neck of the woods is load up your place when you've got the grass and get rid of them when you haven't got the grass. And so this is the number of monthly DSCs on my property over the last five years. And there's some key measures here. This is the start of the drought in 2013. And I was running well over 25,000 DSC. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be right down sitting on top of 5,000 DSC. So that's a massive drop. Um, a lot of profit going into the bank here from selling animals and getting rid of adjustment. But um, uh, if anything, a criticism of myself, having only been at home and run the show for about six or seven years myself, is I wasn't aggressive enough in here when we got a lot of that rain. We've got to get a lot more aggressive at winding up stocking rates and eat that cardboard while it's there to be had and then take the animals away and have, uh, have, have systems that destock and be ready for that sort of thing in the future if, to handle out this variation that's coming our way. Um, this is a genetic story. Um, and you can see uh, there, there's, the, there's the drop in micron, but there's also a drop in wool cut. A bit of a worry, but really what's going on in here, sorry, what's going on in there is I'm shearing a lot more younger sheep. So the wool cut per head doesn't really tell you the right story. But for a benchmarker or anyone that's sitting there thinking about genetics, you'd want to look at that, that, um, that, that pink line or red line and sit there and go, gee, crikey, you know, that wool cut is swinging down a little bit. Um, we're going to re, re alter our genetic uh, indexes to, to head in the right direction and increase wool cut. Labour efficiency is really important in our neck of the woods. So, um, uh, some comments here. This, this is a really tricky little thing. This is in the kitchen and it's got a little LCD screen. It sits on the wall and you touch the screen and it'll tell you the water level in nine tanks across the property. A lot of our job out there is monitoring things, checking stuff. And so it's an example of, of a labour-saving efficiency. I can turn the pump on by touching that green button. It's telling me there's 55% of uh, le level of water in the tank. And um, that's tank two, and I've got nine tanks like that. It's a really simple thing. It works on directed um, Wi-Fi sort of stuff. And it just means that I, can, I don't have to drive up there about through those three gates and go 9K up to that tank to see whether it's got water in it. Uh, I already know. So I can do a water run before I even have a coffee in the mornings. This one here is a story about crutching plants. Uh, there's a bunch of fellas underneath there working really hard. They start in the dark and they, f they finish in the dark. And I think crutching plants have been around in the sheep industry for a long time. I couldn't find a better photo. But it's this, the point I want to make is these guys are making about 800 bucks a day. Um, and I reckon us people, uh, people are in the bush have got to be starting to think, how do we drive uh, and create employment opportunities where young guys can make seriously big money. So these blokes won't go home for a month. They'll just go from property to property to property, earning six to eight hundred bucks a day. That's a bloody big check at the end of a month. You know, you can head back to New Zealand and uh, and have three months over there on the strength of that money. Um, and we've got to be thinking, how do we? Like, I don't want to pay any more for crutching. I'm working on how to get my crutching cost per cost down as a businessman. But I'm also thinking, how do I make it so this guy earns, instead of 300 bucks a day, makes 800 bucks a day? And that crutching cradle is a great way of, of a great example of that way of thinking. Um, some challenges. And, and um, I've, I've, I've spoken about genotype. Um, one of our major challenges is our traditional family farm business model. And um, it's something that, that my wife and I are thinking about. We're going through that phase where you've got to educate your kids at secondary school, so you've got to hike them down to Brisbane. And, um, and we're watching the brain drain occur. And, 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 we're, and I, I just, I'm not sure, but every fan, you know, it's all that's EQ. That's why we've got so many EQ problems out there. That's why suicide's such a big problem, because you're so isolated all the time professionally. You don't have bright people to share ideas with when you want to, ha your, your think tanks are small. So the whole issue about how you structure the family farm business out in our neck of the woods, and it probably goes right across Australia, is the real challenges that we face there, to be able to keep your mind open, keep your business strategic, keep it healthy. Um, here we go, wild dogs had to come up. 
Um, I've got a major whinge about this. Sheep populations right across the parcel zone are under tremendous pressure from wild dogs. Uh, they are causing a massive problem for us and they are wiping out the, the, uh, the Queensland sheep population, if not right around. There's whole areas of parcel zone sheep um, that are no longer running sheep in Western Australia because of wild dogs. And uh, we just, all the solutions being delivered to us at the moment and the activities that are coming out of the NGOs and other agencies are not delivering solutions, you know. It's just an oxymoron, isn't it, that you can get off a smartphone, Skype someone in London and be asked to switch your phone off by a guy who says, I'm now going to give you a trapping workshop lesson, you know, and get told something that your grandfather was once really good at, you know. We've got to get a lot smarter about the living solutions to the wild dog problem. And, and I think one of the, key, the two key solutions that we, we need a bit of work on is um, making a camera that spots a dog at night. That's a trail camera photo of a dog. So we've really grabbed hold of those leisure, the leisure hunting market's got these things. You put them on trails and you can work out where the samba deer are. So when you go up there on the weekend, you can shoot the samba deer because it's going to walk along there. It's really regularly where it walks along. We've jumped onto these things and it tells you where the dog is. And, uh, but we need a system that, that sends that message back to the house straight away. Um, whatever digital image you generate, we need to be able to translate that through to, so we can get a text message. Because really good, once we know where they are, we're really good at killing them, but we're, we can't spot the damn things and get there soon enough. This is a solution that we're inventing, miles and miles of fences. And just to give you an idea of the sheer amount of money we're all going to be spending, if my, a lot of you guys would live in a million dollar house, Imagine being having to put up a $50,000 house uh, fence around your house. Abs adds no value unless you're selling and there's something about fences around suburban houses. But that's the sort of scale of money that we're spending. 5% of our net asset worth we're going to have to spend on fences. So I'm looking at three dollars to $500,000 on, on fencing my place from dogs. There's nothing else I can do. Um, opportunities, there's massive opportunities in remote sensing for us going forward. We've got to get on to um, cost-effective supplementations, all sorts of new animals out there. There's novel enterprises we can be looking at, um, ecotourism and all sorts of things. We're all, us, us um, people on the land, we, we look after a part of the world that a lot of other people love to visit. And I, I'm always thinking about how do we bring the bush and get people out there. There's something about being a farmer that's just huge, huge credibility amongst city folk and there's, there's got to be money in it. Clean green and animal welfare, right? Um, I'm, a, I'm a commodity producer. I, I think like that. But one day it'll be a backpacker who'll be reading Beyond Bar magazine and all the stuff that Jimmy Jackson and all those fellas are doing in AWI will say, have you ever thought about doing that with your wool? And so whilst I don't think marketing and direct marketing with our wool clip, I'm certainly laying down the credentials as we speak so that the evidence trail will be there if I ever get an opportunity to sell uh, clean green wool, that, that they can go and look at all the records and say, gee, crikey, you don't use many chemicals. Gee, crikey, you've got really good records about sheep welfare um, and things like that. OK, there's, there's my summary. There's, there's um, plenty of opportunities to make money out there. I'm, I'm buoyant. I reckon we're going to keep going upwards on that blue, those blue graphs. Um, there's plenty of really good extension messages coming out of AWI and the likes. Um, we've just got to be better at considering them and looking at them and adapting them to our part of the world. Measurement is critical. I mean, the value of those, that, blue, that, that blue stuff on that graph and knowing that about your business is just... Is, a lot of people don't know, so they're, they're sailing blind. And, and as I said, be ready for the next good idea. So I'm harvesting good ideas from all of you guys and, and this conference. Thank you.